you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. One subject causes more friction in the paranormal world than any other. Possession. Cultures and religions all over the world can point to examples throughout their history, both oral and written, and yet in the modern era, it is often dismissed as mass hysteria, propaganda, or misdiagnosis. Dr. Richard Gallagher, a professor of psychiatry at New York Memorial and a psychoanalyst in the faculty of Columbia University, isn't so sure. In his book, Demonic Foes, Dr. Gallagher lifts the lid on his work over the previous 30 years and is now considered the leading scientific expert on possession and discusses some of the cases he's been involved in over that period of time. But before we delve into the dark world of possession, don't forget you can support Mysteries and Monsters by signing up at patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. $4 a month gets you ad-free episodes, guaranteed early releases, bonus content, and more. You can also click the link in the show notes as usual. Mysteries and Monsters is on all social media platforms. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and please subscribe to our channel on YouTube at Mysteries Monsters. You can also visit mysteriesandmonsters.com for news, episodes, and merchandise. Artwork, as always, is by the marvellous Dean Bestall. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. So, is possession nothing more than supernatural exaggeration and silly superstition? Dr. Richard Gallagher certainly thinks it isn't. In the modern pantheon of the supernatural, the realm of possession often causes more controversy than most. Despite such beliefs being with us for centuries, joining me today is Dr. Richard Gallagher, a professor of psychiatry at the New York Medical and a psychoanalyst at the faculty of the Columbia University. Dr. Gallagher is the foremost scientific expert on this subject of demonic attacks, and in his book, Demonic Foes, he looks at his 25 years investigating possession and diabolic attacks. Dr. Gallagher, thank you for joining me today. How are we? Uh, very fine, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. As we were saying before we dove into the interview proper, I found this book both shocking and also refreshingly balanced. I think primarily coming at it from your experience as a psychiatrist, because when we delve into this particular subject, often people will fall into two camps in my personal experience that some people think it's some form of mental illness or delusions or, or some kind of religious diatribe that these people are trying to push or the people that believe these things happen. And looking at your career and how you found yourself following this path, I was really interested that obviously you studied history and, and religious studies at Princeton. So clearly, it's one of those things when you look back, it, it's almost as if life was setting you up for something, even though you didn't know what was coming down the line for you. Well, I think there's something to that. In other words, you know, when, when I, I'm a great lover of history and you realize throughout history how often people believe in a spirit world of, of various sorts and in certain... Uh, phenomena that in the modern world gets called the paranormal, but in fact, in the um, course of most of history was labeled either supernatural or or the term used to be preternatural, meaning, you know, in the realm of demons or something or mm -hmm. evil spirits. And most people throughout history have believed in evil spirits. So uh, I found it fascinating in my studies. It's not something that was covered in a psychiatric residency, which I did at Yale. And it was only a few months months after graduating that a local priest, you know, knowing that I was a Catholic, came to my office and asked me to assess a case that he thought was not possessed. He thought it was uh, a more minor uh, demonic attack 
usually labeled oppression, mm. at least in America. People use different terms around the world. And uh, he asked me to evaluate the case. And I said to him, well, look, Father, you know, with all due respect, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a well-trained psychiatrist and I'm a little skeptical of most of that stuff. Mm. And I remember his uh, surprising me by saying, well, then you're the perfect man for the job. <laughs> uh, so I, I always have gone into this probably by nature. I'm a little bit of a skeptical person, but it's just that over the years, I've seen so many of these cases, uh, you know, I've, I've obviously become very convinced that these kind of states of mind or conditions are which do need to be distinguished from, say, mental illness or people's imagination, but that there does exist this category of uh, conditions that have no other explanation but something like possession. Did you find it helped that you had done religious studies, and as you've referred to there, that you're a practicing member of the Catholic faith, that you were aware of the history of this particular issue or problem or, or belief that had run across continents. And it doesn't just apply to Catholic or the Christian faith in general. We can find examples of these situations occurring across the entire world in all kinds of faiths, regardless of where people find themselves. Well, there's no, there's no question that that's true. And, uh, you know, that was what I think history, uh, study of history opened my eyes to, that not only did all cultures report cases of possession, but that the belief in evil spirits throughout history is a pretty mainstream belief. Hmm. Sometimes, since people know I'm a psychiatrist, they say, well, Dr. Gallagher, how does it feel to be out of the mainstream? <laughs> and I say, well, what mainstream are you talking about? Historically, most cultures you know, from the Far East to the classical world, you know, and from the pagan world to, you know, world religions, have believed in, not not every single one, but most have believed in uh, evil spirits. In, in America today, if you look at polls, the majority of Americans still believe in evil spirits. And if you travel around the world, obviously to places like Madagascar or Haiti, or actually much of the Far East as well, uh, you know, my my book was uh, translated into uh, Japanese recently, and uh, I asked uh, somebody, uh, well, what is the state of belief over there? And they said, well, you know, obviously it's not a Christian society, but uh, they, they almost all believe in evil spirits, spirits and, and including evil spirits. So I don't regard myself, Mr. Storr, as out of the mainstream. Uh, in many ways, it's it's the skeptics, modern skeptics and modern materialists who are out of the mainstream in terms of world history. Mm -hmm. Now, in Europe, of course, the, you know, Europe is fairly secular. Uh, so it's sort of regarded as a, uh, can be regarded as somewhat of an irrational belief or, a, or ascribed to, you know, people who are simply mentally ill or something. But the real reason I wrote the book was to clarify that, yes, there are people with mental illness who think they're possessed and they're not. There are other people who may have sensory misperceptions. There may be people who are charlatans, who push ideas of the paranormal. But that beneath that, there is a, a real reality. Paranormal, um, you know, respecting maybe your audience, is, is in some respect a pseudoscientific term. By that I mean it arose you know, in the in the 19th century, as did mm. the world paranormal, as an attempt to study, in some ways materialistically, things that had always been regarded as spiritual in nature. So, uh, yeah, there's, I think there's a rigor and a science to what I do just as much as uh, anybody else, even mm. the skeptics. I think it's one of those aspects of the whole history of this, as you refer to there about the rise of it in the 19th century, that we had a lot of learned people, especially here in the United Kingdom, who formed the Ghost Club and the Society for Psychical Research. And a lot of them had come from universities and were men of medicine and science. And I think after you had that sort of spiritualist boom that obviously occurred in the US in the, in the latter part of the 19th century and sort of bled into the 
the 20th century and, and the sciences that were going on after the First World War, when people were obviously desperately trying to contact lost loved ones, because for most people at that point, there hadn't been that, that loss of life in the modern era in Europe. But obviously in North America, you'd, you'd obviously still got the ramifications of the Civil War, obviously affecting every aspect of the burgeoning country at that time. I find it one of those points that often gets overlooked that we've got this kind of culture of loss and grief that seems to allow, as you mentioned there, certain people to take advantage of these situations. And do you think, looking back at that particular period, it's why we've ended up in the modern era with it kind of being looked down upon by more academic establishments for, in the large part, obviously there are some universities and men of science and people such as yourself, Dr. Gallagher, that have continued to, to ignore the, the, the modern interpretations of such subjects as nonsense or legends or fiction or some kind of fables, that there is a, a tangible reality to some of this. Nobody's saying all of it's real, but there's certainly something going on. There's a kernel of truth at, at play here. Well, sometimes more than a kernel of truth, sometimes more than a kernel, you know. Mm. Uh, um, you know, I, I, can, I can tell from your summary of the, the modern history, including the rise of uh, what's called modern spiritualism, uh, you know, that you're a good student of this whole intellectual uh, movement in modern times. And you're right that there were some very prominent, you know, even Nobel Prize level people on the Society for Psychical Research. And they were often, you know, good searching people who were mystified by the continuation of these spiritual type of phenomena that they couldn't explain materialistically. And that bunch of people, you know, continue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there are those people. I do think that many of them are, you know, very decent people who nevertheless, perhaps because of their own wishful thinking, do ignore the evidence. Mm. When I work with somebody evaluating somebody, you know, I certainly don't automatically jump to the conclusion that this is preternatural or demonic or paranormal. Uh, you know, I need, I need evidence too. Science as we understand it, to get a little uh, academic here, Science, as we understand it in the modern world, is a little bit different than the way the wor word was used in historically. The, the, the word really comes me from, you know, uh, the uh, Latin word, which meant knowledge. Things that were regarded as genuine knowledge were called science. In the modern era, we think of science as things that can be experimented upon, things that can be replicated about. And that's fine. And it has allowed our, you know, modern cultures to advance scientifically in in marvelous ways, space mm -hmm. travel and antibiotics and all this sort of thing. The philosophy behind that is called methodological naturalism. In other words, the idea that science can advance by studying things using materialism as a hypothesis and uh, excluding sort of more amorphous mental or, or spiritual phenomena. Mm. But, you know, we all use, in addition to the scientific method, we use our testimony. Now, that's another kind of knowledge. I mean, you know, how do people understand most of who their parents were and stuff like that, or history, you know, did George Washington cross the Delaware mm. uh, River? It's it's a matter of, of historical testimony. And that's knowledge, too. Although, again, there are, there are obviously going to be people, the more unusual a phenomena is, there's going to be more debate about that. But mm. I certainly don't think in my work, which is basically based on people's testimony and, and historical information that they tell me, uh, I certainly don't regard that as unscientific. It's just not quite what uh, a more narrow modern definition of science implies. Mm. Absolutely. And I think this is often the, the kind of duality we have with these kind of things, because obviously, as we've touched on, if you say to people, you're a doctor of psychiatry, some people will say, well, what on earth are you getting involved in this kind of thing for? Because they will just 
as far as they're concerned, this is, these are chalk and cheese subjects. They should not be rubbing shoulders together. And yet, in your book, Demonic Foes, you clearly lay out how you got to this particular point, how it started for you. But also what I was deeply impressed with is that these are not all real cases of alleged possession. There are people in here that you've come across and had experiences with who have been pretending or suffering from other kinds of illnesses and ailments. Do you think, because I know when you talk about that, that first meeting in the early 90s, when the father came to see you through your your reputation in the in the local community at that point, do you think that that was one of the key reasons that he came to you because he knew you were a member of the of the Catholic faith, but also that you were a, a man of science working in this particular field? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he had the in a way he was a very scholarly man himself and very knowledgeable. At that time, there were very few exorcists in the United States. Mm. One of the reasons I I learned about so many cases over the years is because, you know, he would send me dozens of cases to be to be evaluated. And he and a colleague of his, both of whom I describe in the book, would actually bring me to cases all over the United States. Mm. So I began to build up a, a great deal of knowledge of these things such that my um, academic chairman of psychiatry, who was a very prominent psychiatrist, said, I've probably seen more of these possession cases than anybody else in the world uh, in history, precisely because of the Internet and things like that. But, you know, the premise of your question is is completely accurate. Uh, First of all, you know, to reemphasize, I never volunteered for any of this. (laughs) I'm not even sure it's a good thing to volunteer. Yes. Uh, But he came to me because, you know, he did think I was a uh, a very well-trained, scientifically-minded uh, person. And uh, again, I always go in into an open mind, and there are these cases, in addition to the ones that, you know, I'm absolutely convinced can only be explained by uh, diabolic uh, influence on a person. Uh, there there are quite a few people who, with mental illness who believe they are possessed or attacked in some way by spirits when they're not. Mm. And I mentioned, as you as you uh, alluded to, I mentioned a couple of cases in the book. You know, I mentioned people who are sometimes psychotic, who think they're hearing the voice of a devil when we know that it's a type of brain pathology, as well as people who are very suggestible. Uh, sometimes we see these people dissociate and sometimes they're histrionic. Those people have often been diagnosed as so-called multiple personality uh, and some of them may feel that they're influenced uh, by uh, what's called an altar uh, that might be demonic, and and yet it's that they're simply uh, suffering from a severe emotional problem. The final group of people who we see a lot uh, is people sometimes who are very very evil, and you know we can't we can't say that every evil person, including the grandiose sociopaths of our day. Uh, are possessed either. So you have to be able to rule out those sort of things. In past eras, because of the advance of science, other medical conditions, especially neurological conditions like temporal lobe epilepsy, Mm. are much less confused because now we have CAT scans and EEGs and stuff like that that can show the organic basis of the uh, pathology. But in past eras, there's no question that certain neurological disorders like uh, Tourette's disorder, for instance, were were thought to be caused by demons, and and it's not. Hmm. I think when we, even if we just look at the the field of psychiatry, how far that's come during this period of time from from perhaps you know when you first started thirty thirty five years ago, Doctor Gallagher, that there has been immense leaps, as you say, coupled with the fact that medical technology has gone on so far because most people are fully aware of of CAT scans these days and. 40 years ago, it was science fiction. You could never imagine that we would have such an ability that you could simply get such clear images of the brain and the functions of it and how things would work and some of the the work that's gone on in in regards to neurology, especially, that some of these, as you refer to there, some of these ailments that we've come to, to consider quite normal these days, such as Tourette's, which seems to be something that's gone from, as you mentioned there, people often prescribing possession or or some kind of 
spiritual influence over these these people that have this affliction or or this illness, depending on on the scale of it, are now able to be treated and and back as as being classed as functional members of society. Because this is the other aspect, I think, of some of the the situations that we've had to deal with that throughout the centuries, some people who through no fault of their own would have some kind of psychiatric disorder or or a neurological condition would be treated as outcasts or classed as being satanic or possessed when they were just, unfortunately, suffering from a severe illness. Yes, that would happen. Uh, But again, you have to realize that, I mean, even in the modern era, let alone in, say, medieval times, there's always a certain religious fundamentalism at the same time Mm. that is especially prone to exaggerate or over overemphasize, you know, someone with a problem, say epilepsy, as being demonic. Mm. But at the same time, you know, there have usually been cooler heads too, Mm. philosophers and medical people who were much more skeptical. So, for instance, uh, the, the, the Catholic Church, which, in my opinion, approaches this stuff generally with the utmost rigor, uh, has been in the habit of using physicians, even in the in the famous manual, Roman Ritual for Exorcist. It advises that, you know, some of these cases may be depression. When the priest is unsure, they should consult a physician. And physicians have been involved in this for centuries. That's mm. That's also a little known fact. And of course, even in the modern era, just as there was a witch hysteria in the um, you know, 17th century and stuff. Um, there are still, you know, hysteria. There, there is still much hysteria about so-called Satanists uh, taking over the government and this sort of thing, you know. Mm. I'm a witness to the, the QAnon conspiracy. Mm. Uh, and when I started out, there was something that was being called at the time. It was kind of a, a precursor to QAnon, you might say. It was called the Satanic Panic. And it was was about, again, I I can see that you're familiar with a lot of this stuff. There were people who were claiming that there were all these Satanists running around every neighborhood. Uh, um, Now, again, a lot of times these hysteria or exaggerations develop because of a kernel of truth. Mm. You know, you use the word kernel of truth to me at one point. For instance, there are Satanists. They're not a lot. I write about one very prominently in the book, a woman who was an out-and-out devil worshiper. She regarded herself as a queen of a, a satanic cult. She was. She described herself as a high priestess. There's no question in my mind, we had independent evidence of different sorts that she was a member of a cult, and she became possessed. But, you know, she was kind of the exception that proves the rule. Hmm. You know, she was a genuine Satanist. It's not like there are Satanists running around amok, running societies and stuff. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Well, it's it's one of those things I think because at the same time that was happening in the in the U.S., it was happening here in the U.K. as well. Right. We had several large satanic cult panics here, right. and when eventually it, it was one of those things where people took it on face value, and it caused irreparable damage to families and communities. And it all got traced back to a, a tall tale that got out of hand. And, and it, there, were, there were innocent people who were accused. There's no question about it. Oh, yeah. People had their children taken away from them, lost their jobs, lost their right. families. It's it's terrifying looking back. So it wasn't just occurring in, in North America. It was certainly I happening was, here in Britain. After my residency at Yale, when I was at Cornell Medical College for a while, we actually studied some of those cases. We studied what's what was called, and you're probably familiar with this term too, false memory. Mm. There are people who have false memory of abuse in general, let alone of satanic abuse. Yeah. Um, now, again, on the other hand, you know, you have to think in a complicated way as a thoughtful person. It built on the real cases. I mean, you know, uh, I worked with uh, a lot of abused patients, inpatients in those days. And the reality of abuse in children is an enormous one. Mm. Uh, and it 
maybe precisely for that reason that other people can get away with either falsely accusing intentionally other people or just somehow manufacturing the idea that they were abused. They may well have believed it, but weren't. Mm. That is more of a minority. It may be with the Satanists, it's the opposite, that there is this rare group of Satanists, unfortunately, too many of whom I have actually come across. <laughs> uh, while on the other hand, there is a widespread exaggeration of Satanists all over the place, you know, wreaking, wreaking havoc. I mentioned in the book that somebody claimed there were uh, somebody very partial to the theories of the satanic panic, you could say, claimed that 50,000 uh, American children were kidnapped by Satanists. And I pointed out that that's more people than were kidnapped in the whole country, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, and, and many of those runaways, you know, were people who were running away from a, you know, unfortunate family situation, mm -hmm. uh, weren't really kidnapped at all. So, yeah. again, it's a field, this whole field of the demonic, you know, witchcraft, um, curses, nefarious, dark figures all around the place is very easily exaggerated in, in a lot of cultures. And mm. to me, still, to some extent, in America. Yeah. It is strange how it seems to be able to be manipulated from both sides, both on people trying to promote themselves of having more power or more reach than they probably have, as you refer to there, or even people who are using it from the opposite side to try and stoke up these feelings towards these communities or these particular people that don't follow what they decide are normal practices or acceptable behaviors for whatever reason, that both sides seem to be coming at this from the same direction, but neither really has the, the evidence or the support of, of what they're trying to promote themselves and end up looking, as you say, when you find out, if you go after these people with facts and figures, their arguments quickly fall apart. But often I think especially during the era of the satanic panic, people didn't have the resources and the reference materials to be able to, to go and look somewhere and say, did 50,000 people really disappear during this period of time? Whereas now you can go online and you can probably debunk it in about 10 minutes if you know where to look. If you know where to look, because if you also go online, you, you may get more and more confused. You know, yes. There's so much uh, misinformation, uh, you know, as well as political information that people manipulate online. So, you know, it's what it, what does it call for? It calls for sober minded, scientifically trained, or at least very thoughtful people to sort out the, um, the, the wheat from the chaff to use the uh, biblical term. When you look back at that first case that the father brought to you, looking at the book and some of the other cases that you mention and discuss in depth, it seems quite quite a minor one in the in the scheme of things but there's also a lot of consistent themes that we hear time and time and time again as someone that's been listening to shows such as this and other people having conversations about this particular topic for probably the best part of 30 years dr gallagher the the whole pretense of people being attacked or beaten or bruised by unseen assailants is something that seems to have been with us for as long as we've been able to discuss these kind of subjects in a in a mature and balanced manner without falling down to any particular rhetoric from whichever belief system we come from so for for me i'm i'm always pleasantly surprised when i look at a body of work such as your book that you explain some of the other potential solutions to these types of occurrences and injuries that can come. And there are obviously types of stress that can cause the body to bruise itself. And as we were talking about false memory syndrome, there are people who will cause themselves injuries and have no recollection of it. There are a variety of, of, of situations like that. So I suppose really it was quite a gentle introduction into the field. When you look at some of the other cases you dive into later on, and I believe it was a, it seems a very pleasant lady who was called Maria, I think, wasn't she? Yes, she was a Mexican-American woman who traveled a long way to see us uh, in my home area. And she basically claimed that she was constantly being beaten up 
literally beaten up by invisible spirits. Now, again, this is not a case that we would call possession, uh, even though terms differ from culture to culture. Uh, we tend to, we tend in America to call this a case of oppression. Hmm. Um, now, even oppressions are, are seriously disturbing conditions. You know, I, I never minimize any anybody who has a genuine demonic attack. Hmm. But it was important that we rule out, you know, uh, medical problems that might appear as bruising sort of out of the blue. Mm. There's a very rare condition called psychogenic purpura. Uh, there are many clotting disorders that can result in easy bruising. Mm. So you want to keep your common sense and look at the totality of the case. And there was no easy medical explanation and we did we did all kinds of tests on her. Hmm. But you want to keep an open mind that this sort of thing can happen. And so, for instance, I interviewed other people who knew her, and including her husband, who was a very uh, uh, gentle, sweet man. Uh, I had to make sure that he, he wasn't beating her and that they weren't using this as a excuse, you know. Hmm. But it turned out that there was no real good explanation for uh, why medically she would be reporting literally being attacked, pummeled by blows from spirits. And there were, there were certain historical reasons why I think she was chosen. It's not like anybody is automatically going to wake up and find out of the blue that they're possessed or oppressed. Mm. There were some historical factors that led me to believe that she might be the type of person targeted by evil spirits. But her story was so consistent. She was such a, a, a truthful person that I also realized that even good people sometimes can be attacked by evil spirits. In the case of uh, the Satanist I, I talk about, it was very obvious that it was because of her Satanism that she was severely attacked. But this woman that I call in the book Maria, she was not in that category at all. Mm -hmm. Julia, Julia, on the other hand, is Maria was helped eventually, and she was eventually uh, the attack stopped. With Julia, uh, tragically, uh, it's the opposite lesson. Number one, she was attacked, possessed, uh, precisely because she was somewhat of a nefarious character, and she. Um, um, had spent many years in a cult worshiping Satan, hmm. uh, kind of uh, the classic um, Faustian bargain, right? Uh, a yeah. fool's bargain to uh, play around with these uh, demonic forces. Now, even though she was a Satanist, she did not want to be possessed. Hmm. So when she came to me for evaluation, uh, it was very clear, and it was very clear to the priest already that that she was possessed. They really wanted me to talk to her, which I did pro bono, why she was so ambivalent about getting exorcisms. Because on the one hand, she wanted to be freed of the spirit. Hmm. But on the other hand, she didn't want to give up her life in the cult. And, you know, the simple cliche about it is you can't have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. what I was thinking. <laughs> she had to turn to God, you know, we Catholics would say to our Lord, to be helped and to renounce her sinful and cultish past. And she was unwilling to do that for various reasons. Hmm. But she told me she was kind of in love with the leader of the cult. She told me that she was afraid that if she left the cult, she would be punished, as as I have no doubt in some ways she would have been. So she was very conflicted, very scared, but because she never really renounced Satan, whom she worshipped, literally, mm. uh, she was she was never delivered. Yeah, so the, the contrast between those two cases is, is valuable, you know. Oh, very much so. I think you can you can look at, especially the first case, as you say, it would be easy to dismiss this as as domestic abuse or somebody trying to cover up for a, for a husband that they love. And I suppose it all depends on the particular society. I'm sure there are 
hundreds of examples of that kind of thing going under the radar in that kind of environment and being sort of even excused as, oh, this isn't domestic uh, abuse. Know, unfortunately, but if you think about it, you know, why would they come 2,000 miles Precisely. to be evaluated by a doctor and a priest? Mm. They would, they would, they would be exposing that sort of thing. Exactly. So again, though, you know, you're right. I had to kind of rule that out first, you know? Yeah. I think when you look at the section, when you talk about Julia, this, the Satanist, when I read it, I actually felt quite sad about it because it's, it's quite a weird situation because as, as you've referred to there, Dr. Gallagher, she was very positive about her role in this particular cult and what she did and what she got from it and the benefits but there were always these sort of moments of clarity when she seemed to realize what she'd got herself into. However, the thing that really strikes me about all of it is, other than I, I just felt deeply sad for this very troubled person, is that there is these incidents that keep occurring because obviously your first introduction to this particular lady is sort of the night before you actually meet her physically when you have a very strange incident at home with your cats. Yeah, my, my wife and I were in the bedroom and uh, we, the, we had two cats and they, they would sleep at the, uh, the end of the bed. And they were fairly placid, well-behaved cats. And all of a sudden, at 3 a.m. or so, they went berserk and they started clawing and scratching each other. I, I say in the book, like champion prize fighters. And we were mystified, uh, you know, maybe they had an excess of catnip or maybe they had some bad food or something. We had to separate them. Mm. And I didn't think much of it. And unknown to me, the priest who was very eager that I see Julia and evaluate her, the next morning <laughs> brings her to my house. Uh, I later told him, don't ever do that again, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, I could I could see this woman in my office. <laughs> and uh, I remember when when I was introduced to her, and it was somewhat of a smart alecky remark on her part. She said, "Nice to meet you, Doctor Gallagher. By the way, how did you like the cats last night?" <laughs> and I was uh, I was annoyed. Obviously, I was I was so taken aback that somehow she would have known that. Yeah. Uh, you know, this had just happened a few hours before. I had certainly not told anybody and not told the priest or anything. And yet she knew it. Now, she had certain abilities. You know, did did in some way she cause it? I don't know. But she had certain abilities to know things that was remarkable. Mm. Another incident, um, she told me she could see some priests at a distance um, and she gave me some examples. Uh, and she tended to respect doctors more than priests. So, you know, when I confirmed to her that I thought she was possessed and, and told her what I thought the remedy was, she took it very seriously what I said, but she sometimes would disparage the priest. Mm. But there was this particular priest who was going to work with her. And uh, she said to me once when I was meeting with her, I met with her a number of times to get to know her and to try to understand why she was so reluctant to leave the cult, hmm. which was really my task. You know, I mean, I, I wasn't going to cure her. She was not a patient of mine. Yeah. Uh, and she said, you know, uh, you know, I, I've told you before, Dr. Gallagher, I can see people at a distance. So I wasn't going to let her get away with it. You know, hmm. I, this time I was going to pin her down. And I said, what the heck are you talking about? She said, well, I can see a priest who was this tough ex-Marine exorcist who lived about 100 miles away from, from us, and he was going to be involved in her exorcisms. And she said, I can see Father A, that's what he called himself anonymously. And uh, I said, yeah, well, so what is he doing now? And she said, well, he's walking along the beach near his house. Uh, he's not at the rectory. He's uh, saying his... Um, I think she said his mumbo jumbo prayers, meaning mm. he was <laughs> reciting the litany, the breviary. And yeah. I said, what is he wearing? He's wearing a um, light blue windbreaker and he has khaki pants on. So I was going to check this out. So I mm. called him on his cell phone <laughs> and I said, you know, Father A, uh, 
what are you doing? And he says, who wants to know? I said, <laughs> I said, humor me for a while. He said, well, you know, usually I'd be, you know, at my residence at this time, but, you know, I decided I'd take a walk along the beach. And I said, what are you doing? He said, you know, I'm saying, I'm saying the, the daily prayers that a lot of priests say. And I say, I said, and what are you wearing? And he goes, oh, Rich, I, I know what's going on. You're, you're talking to Julia, right? <laughs> I said, just humor me a little more. What are you wearing? He said, well, I have my windbreaker on. What color? Blue. And how about uh, how about your outfit? Well, I just have my khakis on. And, uh, you know, I told him that Julia had seen him at a distance. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a paranormal mm. power. I, I would say it's a it's a diabolically infused power that even in her normal state, a lot of times you see very weird things happening when the person goes into a trance and the demon takes over. Mm. But in this case, because of her satanic background, she had some abilities even outside of the trance state. Mm. But I remember the, the priest eventually saying to me, that woman is something else, right? Mm. And it was certainly the case. Could you ever put your finger on why she why she went through this period? Because obviously, as you read the the chapter where you're focusing on this particular case, I was really struck by it. It, it seems to be going one direction to the next. There doesn't. It, it's almost as if she's arguing with herself. One week she'd be all for it. The week after, she's very dismissive of it. And there seems to be this constant conflict either internally or whatever. And I know there, there was one particular conversation that you had where she, she basically told her cult members that she'd, she was going to be some kind of agent and corrupt these priests. But then she was saying, well, that's clearly what I've just told them because I need to get away from them so I can get some help. And then a week later, she's, she's back being dismissive about the, the church and the priests that are trying to help her. I just found this whole sort of roller coaster that she was going through at this period quite striking. It was a roller coaster, and it indicates exactly what you imply. She was a very internally conflicted person. So she was a little bit betwixt and between, you mm. know, she did not. She did not really know exactly what she wanted. She clearly wanted to get rid of the possession. She was mm. aware herself that she was possessed. Mm -hmm. But she was both still enamored of the cult and fearful of the cult. The reason she told me, and she was always told me she would be 100% honest with me, which was refreshing. Um, she also gave me permission to tell her story, mm. which I think was a kind of gift to me. And it was really remarkable that this prominent Satanist would tell me all about her cult. So uh, that's one of the reasons that I eventually, you know, when I was asked to write a book, I included uh, her story, uh, highlighted it, in fact. But again, you're right. She was very um, conflicted and very um, unsure of what was the best course of action. Now, I do believe that she told the cult, because, you know, she was disappearing from the cult for a while, hmm. uh, that she told the cult, the cult and its leader that, um, well, she was really just going to try to, you know, get these priests in trouble because she had to, she had to give some excuse yeah. of why she was meeting with these priests and mm. she was afraid of them. Mm. I don't think she really was serious about doing that yeah. or trying to do that. Uh, and I know, I know the priests were aware of, of, you know, that she might try to do something like that, might accuse them of something uh, that was false. Um on the other hand, um, you know, unfortunately, the side of herself that was afraid of the cult uh, won out, and eventually she she dropped out. It is rather sad to see, because clearly there was something that forced her to sad. seek help. It was sad. It was tragic. And I remember her saying to me once, you know, look, uh, Dr. Gallagher, I worship Satan. I know he has given me favors. He gives me these special paranormal abilities psychic powers, whatever word you're going to, you're going to use. And uh, I like it. You know, I like, I like being able to shock people and 
I like feeling I'm special to Satan. And I, I think Satan, you know, when I die, I think Satan will take care of me. Hmm. Which again, I think is a very foolish thing to say, needless to say. Hmm. She said, well, you know, the God, the, the Christian God that, that I know you uh, believe in, I don't understand him. You know, I just don't understand God. I mean, if he's such a great benevolent person and all powerful, you know, it's a typical, it's a typical anti-Christian argument. If God is so powerful and so good, why does he allow so much evil in the world? Uh, which, of course, theologians struggle with and, you know, come up with the idea that that's the inevitable price of human freedom. Hmm. Uh, but I remember her saying to me specifically, Satan, I know, I think he's going to take care of me. This God you believe in, I just, I completely don't understand him. And I, I think that was that was another part of her ultimate dilemma, you might say. Mm -hmm. Have you seen through your your career over the last 30 years, since you've been involved in this this field, Dr. Gallagher, have you seen spikes where people will go through phases of believing that they are possessed or they they are suffering from some kind of oppression of a variety of because I think one of the key things we we have to take into consideration is popular culture's influence on some people because with the greatest respect there will be some vulnerable people out there who will believe that they are suffering from some kind of possession because these days you can't seem to turn on a paranormal investigation show without them falling into this constant situation of demons being everywhere especially in in the, the US it would seem in certain shows so do you think that still plays an important part in this, which kind of creates too much noise. So we, when you do have real cases and people suffering from real infestations, they often get overlooked or dismissed because it's a popular cliche these days for some people. Well, there's no question that there's an exaggeration uh, in the culture about this stuff, and it's influenced by cultural and media factors. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things that the Exorcist movie did which was which was a fictional movie, but was based on a real case yes. uh, of, a, of a young boy from Maryland, which still gets debated, but I, I feel had a, had a serious demonic attack. Uh, it stimulated a lot of people to imagine that they were possessed, who in fact were just confused or, you know, had a psychiatric illness. And that has continued so that in, say, American culture, which I'm most familiar with, there are plenty of people who think they're demonically attacked in different ways who are not. Mm. And it may just be ignorance. It may just be mental illness. So, again, that's why you have to approach this stuff with rigor. And that undoubtedly throughout history has always been the case. You know, there, there have always been people who have been demonically attacked uh, and on the other hand, there's always been exaggeration and confusion about it. There's also been confusion about what causes a possession. Mm -hmm. For instance, in the Western world, and I would include large periods of Judaism, although most, um, most modern uh, Jews are influenced by the great medieval physician Maimonides' view that, uh, you know, that evil spirits don't exist. He was a good, he was a good doctor, and he kind of thought, you know, eight centuries ago, uh, that these people were just psychotic or something. Mm. So a lot of modern Jews do not believe in the devil, but uh, certainly historically, including around the time of, of Jesus Christ, uh, large parts of the populations and the Pharisees, the leaders believed in demons. And 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 even in the Talmud, there's, there's talk of exorcism. So what I started to say is, you know, large parts of Jewish history, uh, including in the Old Testament, or at least later parts of the Old Testament, it's not emphasized in the usual Old Testament, as well as in Christian cultures, Protestant and Catholic, as well as in Muslim cultures, mm -hmm. where evil spirits are called uh, jinn. Yes. Um, there is this widespread belief in evil spirits, and it, they are believed to be demons, which actually is a comes from a Greek word demon which didn't really mean evil spirits but when it got translated into the Bible it came to be ascribed to evil spirits hmm. anyway I digress 
What I'm saying is large parts of the Western world have always believed in evil spirits as fallen angels. Hmm. But a lot of other cultures, like in the Far East and stuff, and in pagan cultures, they believe in malicious spirits, but they don't necessarily think of it as fallen angels. Hmm. You know, they, they think of it as sprites or other other minor deities who are malicious. For instance, you know, in the Greek world, uh, they believed about their deities that the deities were not all good. And mm. so the deities could also possess people if they were mad at the person. Mm -hmm. And it really was the original pre-Christian Jewish thinkers who began to say, no, you worship these gods because they think they, they think you think the gods can help you and the gods can hurt you and maybe even possess you. But you're really worshiping evil spirits without knowing it. That really was originally the pre-Christian Jews who came up with that, Hebrews uh, thinkers who came up with that idea, which was a great intellectual advance. But in the Far East, for instance, people also believe in evil spirits. Sometimes they may believe they're dead souls. Hmm. And what's striking to me, I'll give you an example of a case. They often still try to hide. For instance, I had a woman that I talk about in the book who originally came to me and she said, well, Dr. Gallagher, um, angels are appearing to me and they're telling me to do something which I don't agree with. Uh, what do you think? And I said, well, I'm not really sure. They may be sort of, this may be a trick. Hmm. Why don't you go and pray and, you know, get the help of a priest and see if you can sort this out. She came back to me a month later and said, Dr. Gallagher, you're right. They, they, they told me who they really are. They're dead souls. She go, and I go, do you believe that? And she goes, no, I'm kind of like, like a spiritualist, you know, uh, believing in, in communication from dead souls. She wasn't possessed, but she was hearing these spirits. And I had already ruled out that she was schizophrenic or something like that. Hmm. And, I, and I, I said to her, well, I kind of agree with you that I don't think they're dead souls. You know, keep praying. And eventually she came back and she said, Dr. Gallagher, you know, we were right. They, 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 are, they finally have had to admit under the influence of the priest that they are evil spirits. Mm. And that's very typical of an exorcism, too. So, for instance, you know, I'm not an exorcist. I don't pretend to be an exorcist. And uh, but I've observed quite a few exorcisms. And often for a while, the demons will lie and they will say, um, you know, I'm uh, this dead famous person, Judas Iscariot or something. Mm. Or uh, I, I have had possessed people say to me, believe it or not, you know, I'm in touch with Zeus. Yeah. <laughs> that, that Zeus is talking to me. Right. Somebody said to me, you want to talk to him? And I said, not particularly. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's characteristic of exorcisms. Again, they, these are remarkable facts, but you know, it's a, the world is an odd place. Mm. During an exorcism, successful series of exorcisms, often takes more than one, the demon is forced to admit finally who they are. Mm. And they do it reluctantly. And there's a little bit of a, a kind of a perception that if you get the name of the demon, it's helpful. There's a reason for that. It's because the demons are trying to hide and not reveal who they are. Mm -hmm. After all, throughout history, they basically have successfully confused a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily want to make themselves so obvious although they do at times to, to, to vulnerable people. They, they really, especially in the modern era, they want to hide. You know, Baudelaire, the famous French poet, said uh, the devil's greatest trick is, is to pretend he doesn't exist. Mm. So they have this kind of dual wish to both scare people as well as um, hide themselves, uh, which seems paradoxical, but it depends on the particular individual, mm. as, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, by the way. And so when the demon is forced to reveal who they are, it's usually with reluctance. And what it means is that the devil is submitting to the authority of the church and ultimately of God. Mm. And that's really what they don't want to do. 
In other words, the, the demon is being commanded, tell us your name. They try to hide until they're forced to submit. And that's a good sign in large part because you're now seeing that the demon is under the control of the authority of the church and of God and of Christ, as we as we Catholics believe. Hmm. So it's, it's remarkable that they pretend to be other things, you know, even in the Jewish tradition, you know, people have claimed to be um, possessed by wandering souls, which are called dibbics. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the idea is that these are dead souls possessing people. You know, uh, I do not believe dead souls people. I do not believe pagan gods possess people. Uh, you know, I believe it's always been evil spirits possessing people. Uh, and then lying about it to confuse people. Hmm. I think for anybody who's not really dove into your work before as well, Dr. Gallagher, they may be surprised to hear that the church have an approach where they seek medical assistance. But I think once you look into the modern exorcism, because I think, once again, we we suffer sometimes in this world that people's ideas of what goes on is entirely based on popular culture. And as far as they're concerned, that's all that happens. So for anybody that thinks of an exorcism, most people will think of what Karras and Merrin do in, in the film rather than the actual reality of it. So do you find it still surprising that people don't understand that there, are, there is a medical pathway that they tend to follow because they want to rule everything out first. Because I would imagine, as we've touched on earlier, they will get a lot of people who, for a variety of reasons or from certain backgrounds, will be convinced that they are possessed when clearly there's other things happen to them in their lives that have put them in a point where they feel that that's what they're occurring. And yet I think some people who would like to dismiss the, the, especially the Catholic Church's role in this, Dr. Gallagher, will say that they'll accept anybody telling them they're possessed, when clearly the evidence shows that that simply doesn't happen. They want to make sure that they've covered every other explanation. Well, again, I, I, I can't speak for every fundamentalist exorcist, but you're absolutely right that in the Catholic Church, it's very rigorous. Hmm. Pretty much in America, it's required that you get a medical and usually a psychiatric evaluation. Even in even in the movie, remember the the father Karras, who is the original priest involved before he brings Father Merrin in. Mm. Uh, father Karras was a psychiatrist. Yes, and you know, in the real life case, based on this uh, boy from Maryland, who was eventually delivered successfully by the by the Jesuits, actually in St. Louis at the time. Mm. This 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 boy went under a lot of medical exams before the Jesuits uh, agreed to, to work with him. So uh, by and large in modern societies and in large parts of Europe, as well as certainly in America, uh, the church pursues a very rigorous practice before they uh, allow an exorcism, uh, which has to be allowed by the bishop, who's usually a, a fairly educated man who has to, you know, ultimately approve. Uh, so it's a it's a long process, and um, you know it's 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 again it's it's a it's a rigorous diagnostic process. Mm. The, the The way it's recognized is that in the official manuals, the exorcist uh, is supposed to have a moral certainty, mm. which means that he is supposed to be ab very convinced that this is a this is a true demonic possession as opposed to, you know, say, somebody's imagination or medical problem. Mm. And that's been going on for hundreds of years. Yeah. Have you still found yourself surprised when you are invited to deal with new cases? Because obviously you have continued to build your reputation and working alongside the church and become invited to join the international exorcists in regards to your assistance that you offer them on a on a medical and scientific aspect, Dr. Gallagher. Is it something that I suppose sometimes people can be quite churlish about these subjects and go, well, if you've seen one, you've probably seen them all. Reading your book and, and knowing the little that I do about it, I know that this is once again one of these phenomena that it's not always the same. 
Some things are dealt with a lot easier than others. It all depends on the person, their health, the situation. There's a lot at play here. So do you think it's still one of those situations that you never say never when you work in this particular field because you never know what the next case may be like? Well, keeping in mind that I, I, I never volunteer, that these are people who ask me to help. I mean, mm. even joining the International Association of Exorcists, obviously as a more of a scientific advisor than as an exorcist, which I'm not, mm. uh, you know, I was asked to join. You know, I was asked to write the book. Uh, I'm actually being asked to participate in the movie. Mm. Uh, so... The cases I see are people who ask for my help, and often through the clergy. Hmm. Um, and you're right; it's every case is is a little bit different. You know, I mean, you never in medicine we call making a diagnosis a syndrome, hmm. and again, you you take the totality of the symptoms and signs, and you make a diagnosis. It's very similar with uh, a serious demonic attack and, and a possession. You know, there are certain things you look for, you mm. know, evidence of the paranormal, evidence of a, a serious attack upon a person. Mm. Paranormal is ultimately evidence that a foreign entity is involved. You know, you see, you see a hatred of this entity towards sacred things. Mm. You see something in their history that explains it. So it's it's a syndrome. And that's how you can, you know, discern that there is a genuine condition, say, of possession, which is very similar to making a medical diagnosis. You know, mm. that's what you do. I mean, you know, people's cases of pneumonia, for instance, are often a little bit different than each other. But, you know, you have enough common features that, you know, and x-rays and stuff like that and history of, you know, contagion. Yes. that you make the diagnosis mm. very similar, but you're also underscoring that each case is a little bit different too. Mm. And the cases we're talking about mainly are people who seek help, people who have what I would call an involuntary possession. Mm. Those, they, they, they don't want the possession. They may have done things that brought it about or facilitated it, but they don't, they want to get rid of it. Yeah. There are also people who are voluntarily, voluntarily allow themselves to be possessed. Mm. And there are also cases that to show the diversity, there are cases that seem to be where somebody is possessed for only a short amount of time. Uh, again, there are reasons for that, but as opposed to the, the more chronic cases of involuntary possession, those are the people who seek the help of the church. But there's this diversity of opinion. There are some people who the demon will manifest itself while the victim is awake. Mm. And, you know, and there are other cases that will only truly manifest themselves when the person is in a trance, especially during the exorcism. So there is this wide variety of cases. So, you know, you never, you never quite know what's going to walk through that door. Well, I suppose that's one of the, the surprisingly enticing aspects of this because of where you started in the first case you had stepped through your threshold into, into your office all those years ago. And yet here you are, you're still learning new things. You're still changing your perceptions of reality on what the potentials are here because I would imagine there will be cases that make you question everything that you believed, regardless of whether you are a... Uh, a person of a of a faith based slant, or someone completely coming at this as a as a cold hard science. Well, I, ca I can't say that I'm surprised too much anymore. You know, <laughs> I mean, on one level, I've seen it all, so to speak. On another level, again, the diversity keeps you thinking. And like any good doctor, any good doctor is going to remain learning their whole lives. Mm. So uh, otherwise, you might uh, you might. Hand in your shingle, as they say. Yes. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, you know, there is also such a diversity. I mean, we've mainly talked about possessions, but, you know, there are also these cases of oppression where people may be beaten up mm -hmm. or uh, choked or scratched or something like that. And there are also cases of what we call, which are even more controversial, 
internal, uh, what I call internal oppressions, where the person's mind is is attacked with images and visions and stuff like that. Uh, so there's no there's no end to the diversity of of how the demons might attack or manifest a person, which I suppose does kind of keep you learning about a new type of case, you know. Mm. But I, I wouldn't exactly say I'm surprised by anything anymore that walks through my door. I mean, I have a pretty confident faith at this point in my life, and it's it's. I I don't think it's likely that my ultimate views are going to change all that much. <laughs> Is it something that I suppose as well, Doctor Gallagher? You will always have people in your particular peer group or. or in your circles that will just think that this is nonsensical, that a man of your your education and your experience has found themselves in this situation. But I would also suspect that a lot of people are quite happy to talk to you about this, but probably off the record and agree with you or tell you about cases that they've had to deal with that, in their opinion, are clearly possessions or oppressions of whatever nature. Well, here too, or there's a great diversity. So, for instance, uh, quite a few people. I mean, the book has sold very well. Mm. And, so, you know, there's a lot of people who are interested in this topic uh, and fascinated by the topic, even if they don't you know, necessarily agree with my explanation. Mm. Um, there are plenty of people who talk to me privately and will often admit things to me. I mean, if I had a nickel for... Everybody who's told me, you know, Dr. Gallagher, I haven't never told anybody else this in my yeah. life. <laughs> yes. uh, I'd be a very rich man. <laughs> uh, so they tell me things that are very private, in part because they quite they quite uh, astutely recognize that if they told too many people, people would regard themselves, regard them as crazy. Yeah. And they know they're not crazy. Yeah. So, you know, they relish being able to talk to someone like me. Then there were other people who were confused. I don't actually run into, on a personal level, all that many people who overly challenge me. Hmm. They're, they're kind of the uh, internet cowboys who who challenge people online anonymously, <laughs> or people who are right for like these skeptical magazines and stuff. Now, you know, I have been I have been criticized in print by by those type of people. But what I find is that they don't really understand the field very much. They don't understand the facts. They are too biased by their own preconceptions to um, to really look at it, look at the facts objectively. Mm. And some of those people eventually are persuaded. Mm. But, you know, uh, most people are just so locked into their if they're a materialist, you're basically talking about materialists. You know, some people are very wedded to strict materialism. And if you're wedded to that, anything that strikes you as a theistic belief or a supernatural belief, let alone a demonic belief, is sort of going to be threatening. So it's very hard for those people to, in my opinion, acknowledge the truth about this stuff. Hmm. Uh, but again, you know, I think I said before, I have had people say, how does it feel to be out of the mainstream? And in some ways within my field, I'm a little out of the mainstream mm. because, and that's because it's, it's not because there aren't, you know, many psychiatrists and mental health people who are open to, you know, faith-based explanations, but by and large, they, they like Freud, you know, they, they are a little more hostile or skeptical of religion. And as mental health people, they see these people who will complain, well, you know, the devil is, I'm hallucinating the voice of a devil. And so they they overgeneralize, they, they begin to think, well, all these cases that, mm. you know, get written about must be bogus cases, just mentally ill people. Mm. So they don't have, in some ways, they don't have a broad enough perspective. The way I will often phrase to people is, yeah, well, how many mentally how many mentally ill people do you know who levitate? How many mentally ill people do you know who all of a sudden will speak a foreign language that they never knew? 
That's not that's not mental illness. No, that's something beyond. They they just kind of dismissed those cases. Well, I didn't see it, so you know, I <laughs> don't necessarily believe it. Absolutely. Even though I've spoken to about thirty five people in my life, I've never seen a levitation, mm. which is rare, but even in possessions. But I have spoken to about thirty five people in my life who either claim to have witnessed it or experienced themselves. Mm. Well, I mean, even even the aspects of certain people gaining supernatural strength, some people would say, being able to throw people around the rooms or fight off three or four people trying to hold them down. There are numerous situations, and we know that can happen in the real world, even if we're talking outside of, of this particular subject, Dr. Gallagher. That can happen. There are certain people that can develop superhuman that's a, strength. That's a particularly confusing uh sign, you might say, mm -hmm. because yes, we know that under extreme conditions, uh, say, freeing somebody from being trapped by a car accident, you know, mm -hmm. that certain people have seemed to muster a, a level of strength that is unusually uh, powerful, mm -hmm. or people in a manic state, for instance, mm -hmm. Yeah. may may be, seem to be so hyperactive and energetic that you say, this is not normal. Hmm. But the kind of cases I write in the book where superhuman strength is another sign just goes so far beyond that. Hmm. For instance, I, I give the example of a woman that I call um, Barbara. And, you know, uh, she was undergoing a, um, probably what we'd call a deliverance prayer by a, Lutheran deacon. Uh, she was brought up Lutheran. And this woman was about 80 pounds soaking wet. Mm. And the deacon was this, you know, big guy, 200 pounds or so. And when the demon manifested through her, through, you know, he was saying the prayers over her without taking the proper precautions of holding her down. Mm. He took uh, this woman, the demon, through the woman, took the guy and threw him all the way across the room. Now, nobody in that room observing, they should have been holding her down, but they weren't. <laughs> but there was a, nobody in that room had any doubt that that was superhuman strength. And mm -hmm. there have been very remarkable other things too, where some little girl will hold up two grown men in their hands. You know, I yeah. mean, these things are, are also very rare, but they're, they're very well documented. Mm, absolutely. Well, it's a fantastic book, and it's one of those that challenges anybody's preconceived perceptions. And um, it, it, it's one of those things where I get to read so many books on a variety of topics, Dr. Gallagher. This is one I know I'm going to go back to time and time again, because I think this is going to be a, a text that I will use for reference or personal inspiration when I'm looking into other reports of such things. So for you... Obviously, the book has been a phenomenal success around the world. It's wildly popular. What's next for you, and, and do you have any final thoughts? Well, first of all, thank you for the high praise. And, I, you know, I've been impressed in talking that you are quite knowledgeable about this whole, this whole field, and you, you, you clearly read my book very uh, closely. So uh, you're, you're a fine interviewer. Uh, the book is is readily available. I mean, most people probably get it on Amazon, and uh, it's it's in a, a lot of bookstores. It's coming out in paperback. Uh, you know, I'm not a very materialistic person. However, uh, I'm sure HarperCollins is, is very happy that you're mentioning the book. I was very happy that HarperCollins published the book yes. because they let me write the book that I wanted, you know, yeah. I mean, without telling interesting stories, without, you know, being simplistic or overly sensationalist. You know, in the future, I continue to be a member of the International Association of Exorcists. I continue to be referred cases. Uh, I cannot see every case that tries to contact me. There are only 24 hours in a day. And, you know, I'm a mm -hmm. very, still a very busy psych board certified psychiatrist who tries to help a lot of people. I, I would say that the major reason that I got involved in this field was to help people who, you know, might, might, not be able to access expertise in this area otherwise. Mm. I and mean, that's what I do as a physician. And these people, people should not be so dismissive of this field that they don't recognize these people are very suffering people. Mm. 
what was I supposed to do? Just ignore them? Yeah. I mean, you know, so it's kind of a privilege that somehow without volunteering for this, I got involved in this field. And, you know, I'll continue to, to write about this. Uh, there is uh, eventually a, a Hollywood movie uh, in part based on the uh, Julia, the, the satanic queen. Mm. That's the title of the movie. Uh, that'll come out. So I'm involved in a lot of ways in, in trying to share my experiences. And again, it's it's not for, you know, publicity reasons or something like that. I don't care about the publicity. Uh, it's it's because I think, I you know, I have an important message that hopefully providentially, you know, I'm meant to as a, as a, as a doctor simply tell people about that, that is that is my chief motivation, you know. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Gallagher, it's been a pleasure to have a thoughtful and deeply interesting conversation with you about this subject. As I said earlier, it's a fascinating book that will challenge any perceptions you may have coming from either side of the argument, I think. And I'll put links to everything in the show notes as I normally do. And I would just like to say thank you so much for your time and your conversation today. It's been amazing. Well, thank you for doing a very... Uh... A very in-depth, uh, intelligent interview. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm impressed by your ability to do that. So thank you for the invitation.